Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you for coming to this One Book event. Um, as you know, our One Book this semester is Aya Malala. She's a young woman who was shot by the Taliban while pursuing her education. Um, and we're very proud to have our own Greg Satharis, who will be introducing our keynote speaker. So let's give it up to her, Greg. I like being introduced when people say, let's give it up for Greg. I, I don't get that very often. Uh, well, it's wonderful to be here with you, and it's wonderful, uh, a, a great uh, opportunity and privilege I have to introduce Shabazz Khan. Now, one of the, one of the really powerful mes messages, which, which I think will come, which I hope will come from this, uh, is that we have, uh, a, uh, we have a diversity and an ex uh, a breadth of experience here at BCC in our student, our faculty, and our staff. Uh, that's really incredible, and I think that it's something that the more that we get to dialogue with one another uh, and learn from each other and each other's experiences, I think the more powerful uh, the experience of being here at BCC. Uh, so without, uh, former, without further ado, uh, please welcome uh, Shabazz Khan, one of our own BCC students. Good morning, everyone. I'm not too short, so I have to put this down. Uh, my name is Shabazz Khan. I'm from Pakistan. Um, I came to the United States in 2009 uh, due to um, some political conditions and some bad conditions that we had um, in 2009. My father was a politician, and he used to work with people, um, help with people in his state uh, to make sure everything was going well and it was going the way we wanted it to be. But we came because my dad got some um, threats from Taliban who came in power back in 2005 to 2010. And due to that condition, we had to leave because he was going to get killed. So this is why I'm glad to be here in a country where I can say I'm pretty safe. I don't have to think about getting shot in the middle of the day, going to school. I'm pretty safe. So I want to tell you guys a little bit about, about Pakistan and where it is located, the states and the people. Pakistan is located in the Southern, South Asian uh, continent. It's in Asia. It got its independence from uh, England, Great Britain, on 14 August 1947. The official language of Pakistan is, we might not all know, is English, but the national language of Pakistan is Urdu, which is spoken in mostly all of the Pakistan country. The capital of Pakistan is Islamabad, and there are four states in Pakistan, KPK, Sindh, Punjab, and Balochistan. And Pakistan is the only nuclear Islamic country in the world. There's a lot of interesting things that uh, you guys may not know about Pakistan. Is One of them is K2. K2 is one of the second largest mountain in, pa in the world. And it's located in Gilgit, Baldistan, which is bordered with China. And the other interesting fact about Pakistan is it makes about 60% of footballs in the world. And recently, we had a FIFA World Cup, and it, all of the footballs were made in Pakistan. And it was made by females, not males. So it was made by all women in Pakistan. And another great thing that I'm proud of being Pakistani is that Alexander the Great his last journey was in Pakistan, and it ended in Pakistan. He died with all of his soldiers. When he went to, uh, on his journey, he stayed, and the dead end for him was Pakistan. So he stayed in my state, the northern part of Pakistan, for the rest of his life, and got sick and died. But the remaining people, his soldiers, were were uh, left it, so they never returned to their own um, land. They end up staying in Pakistan. And the bottom three pictures that I have, the people of Kalash, is believed to be the soldiers' families that end up staying back in the days from the Alexander the Great family uh, 
Alexander the Great soldier's family that end up staying in Pakistan. So there's a state in Pakistan, not a state, there's a city in Pakistan known as Kalash, a valley in Pakistan known as Kalash, and these people are non-Muslim, so they practice their own religion in the northern part of Pakistan. One of the states uh, in Pakistan is KPK, which is Kabul Pashtun Kwa. It's mostly based on the Pashtun population. I'm Pashtun, and as you um, may know, Malala Yousafzai was from KPK. She was Pashtun too. It's about 20, 21 million people that uh, stay in Pakistan, uh, Pashtun uh, state KPK, and it's mostly the whole culture and ethnicity is based in Afghanistan. So most people came from Afghanistan back in the day and end up staying in Pakistan. And Pashtun makes about 21 million population in the state of KPK. They have different culture, different food, different clothing style, and different lifestyle. And the people of KPK are known as Pash uh, Pashtuns. There's the state of Punjab, which makes about almost 52% of Pakistan population. And it's one of the most populous state in Pakistan. The people of Punjab are known as Punjabi. Different food, different culture, different language, and different clothing style. Another state that I will be talking about is Balochistan. It's one of the least populous state, and um, it's mostly desert. Different food again, different language, different culture, and different clothing style. So every state has its own culture, its own history, its own geography, different weather, and different clothing styles. There's the last state is about a million people. It's known as Sin, it's also one of the least populous uh, state in Pakistan. And once again, different food, different clothing, and different languages. This is why Urdu is known as a national language of Pakistan, because Pakistan has about 27 languages spoken in all different parts of Pakistan. It has a lot of natural resources. It has coal, oil, water, mining, and salt as well as some gold. But I've talked to you guys about this great you know, country where you have different people with different languages, different cultures, this great diversity with so many resources. So the question that would come in all of our mind is why is Pakistan not a stable nation? So my answer would, to that would be is I was born in 1994. I'm about 20 years old, and we had one of the worst earthquakes that took place in 2005. It was October the 8th, 2005. It was about 8.50 a.m. in the morning, and the most uh, affected area by that earthquake was Swat and Kashmir. 80,000 people died, not long ago, just seven, eight years ago, in 2005. 80,000 people died, and about 3.5 million people were affected, mostly in Swat and Kashmir. So let me focus on Swat Valley, just because of what this whole uh, project is about, about Malala and the One Book Project. Swat Valley had Taliban living in them without us even realizing that we have a lot of people that are extremists. Where are these extremists coming from? They came from Afghanistan after 9-11, after US uh, attacked um, and sent military to kill a lot of Al-Qaeda leaders in 2001. So when these people, be because of Afghani leaving their nation to seek is in relocate in a safe country, Pakistan offered some help. And Pakistan told them that we would take you. We would give you shelter, food, clothing, everything. We will take you and you can be a refugee and stay in Pakistan. Many people came to Pakistan during uh, the war with Afghanistan and US. 
the war between Taliban. But the check and balance wasn't right. The security wasn't very tight. So we had a lot of people, a lot of extremists that just migrated within the Afghani population to Pakistan and they all came to the state of KPK, which is the northern state of Pakistan and it's bordered with Afghanistan. So that is why Swat in Kashmir were the most affected areas by Taliban because they both these both valleys are in the state of KPK. The rise of Taliban came in about 2005 when uh, Taliban offered some help to these Swati people, the people of Swat. When earthquake took place in 2005, Swat was just a, a detached valley from Pakistan. No one paid attention what Swat's look like. People wanted to go and visit. They had fun in Swat because it's a beautiful valley. And it was known as uh, a Switzerland, a valley of Pakistan, which was also called a, a valley that looks, that's like as beautiful as Switzerland. So when the earthquake took place, the government did not do anything, not even offered a help. So here you have people struggling with life. About 80,000 people died, about 2.5 people became homeless, and the government of Pakistan is still sleeping. They are not offering any help. So what these people did, or we can say militant, or the group of people, the Taliban did, is they took advantage of advantage of the time in the system. They offered some help. And the people of Swat and Pashtun people would not take help from you. But if they do, then they mean to give you something in return. That's the problem with Pashtun people. But I think it's a good thing. But they didn't realize who the people, uh, who were they getting the help from. So when Taliban offered some help back after the uh, earthquake, uh, many Swatis uh, got their shelter, their food, some money from these Talibans, from these militant groups. And most Pashtuns in Swat were really happy from them. There's a picture of uh, Taliban station in Mata. So as I'm talking uh, about this whole event, I'll come back to this picture and explain what is this for. So when Taliban came in um, and uh, offered some help to these Pashtun people, they were pretty happy. But then as time went by, these people end up giving them their own land for Taliban to settle in because they, the Taliban pretended to just be the refugees from Afghanistan and wanted to stay for a couple of more years. And the people of Swat were very happy to offer some help just because of the Taliban helping them during the earthquake. So most people in Swat end up helping them by giving their houses, by giving their pieces of land so the Taliban can live on. And when Taliban start living, they end up getting some power and they decided to control the whole valley. And the whole valley, as I told you, is like really detached from Pakistan. So we don't provide them electricity. We don't provide them water. We don't provide them like TV stations. So all they had was the radio system which they could use and hear the news either internationally or nationally. And they had their own different life, their own different lifestyle. And once again, as I said, they were really detached from Pakistan. It is, it is really sad for me to say that we never cared about who the people of Swat were, who the people of Kalash were, who the people of Kashmir were, because we were too busy in our, uh, in our own lives. So Taliban took advantage of the system and start controlling the area. And they start running ads on radio stations by telling people that Guess what? They were the one who helped you during um, the uh, 2005 earthquake. So they should start controlling the uh, Swat Valley. And most people agreed. Most people were like, hey, guess what? The government of Pakistan never helped us during 2005 earthquake. Let Taliban do something. Back then, they weren't Taliban. They were just uh, refugees from Pakistan. So the Swat Valley decided to you know, accept 
their uh, offer and they were like, that's fine. Taliban were pretty smooth in the beginning. They used to run radio stations. They used to have radio uh, programs every night talking about this great Islam, Islamic religion and their Islam is much better than the Pakistani Islam because of uh, different beliefs within the same religion. So what they started doing, they were pretty smooth in the beginning. They were like, here you go, you know, we would be ruling you and um, we're going to form an Islamic system, which most people agreed upon. But as time went by, they started coming, with, coming up with resolutions saying that you are not allowed to listen to music, the women are not allowed to go outside of house to like supermarket or shopping, and if you really want to go, you have to go with your male guidance. The schools were the girls were banned to go to school. That was another problem. And if you are a woman, you are sick, you cannot go to your doctor. Because as, in, as a Pakistani, most of our doctors are male. It's just, again, the education. We just pretend to um, get education for a guy, but the woman get to stay at home and take care of kids while the husband is making money. And they also made it illegal for men to shave. So men were not allowed to shave their beard. Uh, that's one of the pictures uh, that there's a writing in blue, and that says that men are not allowed to shave. And the other thing they started to uh, force was women wearing this black veil, which is shown in one of the pictures, if she decided to go outside of the house. Number one, she can't. But if she does, she have to cover her whole body. And uh, this, they did a lot of things that, as they did these things, people of SWAT starting to realize that this is the same things that were happening before 9-11 in Afghanistan. So they started to realize, wait a minute, there's something wrong. This isn't Islam. This isn't what they should do to us. So some people end up speaking out. Guess what? If you speak out, you are dead. You cannot speak out while the Taliban are ruling. Uh, there's a lot of people that I know. There's a person that I know. He is from Swat Valley. His name is Ghani Khan, and he used to sing. And one day he was returning home from the uh, music concert and he was shot because he used to sing. And to be a singer, to be a dancer, to have fun, it was just something that you can do during Taliban rule. So life under Taliban was pretty tough and pretty hard. They used to be bomb blast almost every day. I could not I remember a day where we had no bomb blast. I used to be scared of going to shopping mall. I used to be scared of even going to school. Our schools were banned almost every day just because of these things happening in the state of KPK. And we would send letters uh, through these militant clubs that if you, if you do go to school, we will like explode your school. The school that I went to was a mixture. It was a private school, so it was a mixture of females and male students. And our school was a military school, so we were banned to go to that school just because the school is private and it's a mixture of males and females. To Taliban, to what Taliban understood is that they believe that you cannot sit next to a female student even though you might be 12 or 13. You know, you guys might be teenagers, but you just cannot sit with them. It's a sin for you to sit or shake your hand with the female person. That's what they believed in. But these Swati people and the people of Pakistan thought that this was just ridiculous. This was something they wanted, they did back in Afghanistan before 9-11 and after 9-11, so the people of SWAT started to realize that. A person stood up in the valley of SWAT, um, Malala, she was a student, and she was also a educational activist in her valley. Um, I just believe that whatever she did was just amazing. 
because as a female and standing up for her rights and the value of SWAT was just impossible because we all believe that nothing is possible, nothing is impossible, but I think that this was impossible and she made it possible because being a female and having a culture of Pashtun and doing something that no one would expect you to do, and she did it. I think that was just amazing. Another thing I want to mention before, before I go over um, what Malala did was many Taliban, Taliban leaders started to burn CD shops. When they said no music, they used to burn CD shop almost every night. They used to do it at nighttime because at nighttime the shop used to be closed. So one of my cousin's CD shop was burned in the middle of midnight just because he owned a CD shop. And for them to believe that listening to music is a sin, that was their reason to burn his CD shop or the music shop. So Malala, she lives in uh, Swat District in the state of KPK. She's known for her activism, activism for women's rights and uh, what she did uh, by speaking up you know, for her rights and other girls in Swat Valley. When Taliban ruled Swat, they banned girls from going to school. So schools were banned. And many people like her father stood up and said, you cannot ban a girl from going to school. So when girls started to go back to school, the Taliban had no other way except exploding and bombing their schools in the middle of the night full of books and full of the holy book that we have. We, we are required to take one of the Islamic class uh, once a year, every year in our high school. And without them realizing, there was holy books that we believe in that they read but interpret it different in a different way and we read and interpret it different way. They they just did not care what the school had. They just blow up schools full of books, full of some beautiful writing that we have and that we can learn stuff from. They just exploded the schools in the middle of the night. So the morning you wake up, you have no idea that your school has been blown away by uh, Taliban. She was, uh, she was returning from school um, back to her house um, on October 9, 2012, and she was shot by one of the Taliban uh, gunmen. Uh, the gunman walked towards, you know, toward her, towards her wagon and stopped her wagon, went in and asked who Malala was. A couple of her friends did not say anything. They kind of looked at Malala, and the gunman knew who they were looking at because he knew that it must have been Malala. And he shot her, and she got injured in the back of the head and the neck. Two other girls were injured, one of the uh, best friends of Malala. And one of the girls that was injured uh, with Malala is recently, um, and she recently moved to Birmingham, and she's studying in the, uh, uh, one of the universities there. As Malala was shot, her father was um, in one of the uh, news conferences uh, with other people, with other men in his um, uh, valley in SWAT. And he got the news. He did not believe it. He said, you know, uh, somebody told him that Malala got injured. And he was like, it must be a minor injury. So he didn't even pay attention. But another person came in and told him that uh, Malala got shot by one of the Taliban gunmen. This is where... Uh, he, you know, stood up and he's like, I have to leave and see my daughter. She was airlifted to the uh, hospital in Peshawar, which is the main, uh, which is the capital city of the state of KPK, uh, where her bullet was removed from the neck. Later, she was taken to Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham, England, and um, treated for... Uh, the, she was treated for her neck and the back of the head to do her surgery so she can get out. After spending some time in being unconscious for about 24 hours, almost a day, uh, she woke up 
in a hospital in Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. And the parents end up uh, seeing her after about two days, three days of um, the day she got shot. So right now, currently, they live in Birmingham, England, and uh, she goes to school full time. Uh, I was reading one of the articles about Malala, and she said, um, I was also curious, I, I was always curious, why don't she have Facebook page? And she said that um, I'm too young for Facebook, so right now I want to finish my school. And then eventually when she goes to college, she might have a Facebook page. So. She also won the Pakistan First National Youth Prize, as well as recently she won one of the Nobel Prize. Uh, uh, and she is the first Pakistani who won one of the Peace Nobel Prize in the world. She was also nominated uh, for a lot of prizes, and she also received a lot of cash prize from uh, Pakistani uh, officials. This is when the Pakistani official woke up and did something because the news got pretty uh, uh, popular on the international media. And this is Swat Valley, beautiful valley, and our family used to take us almost every six months to visit Swat Valley, so it's beautiful. I want to go back to... Um, this picture um, on the board, it says a station for Taliban. So you can see how strong Taliban's were in Swat Valley. They had stations. They had made their own different Taliban Talibani schools where they recruited people from age 13 to 21 because that's the age where you don't have you are getting, you're really immature, you know, and you're trying to understand what life is really all about. And they recruited a lot of kids from age 12 to 21 to use against the people of Pakistan and against the humanity, in another word. So you can see how well organized this whole uh, militant or the Taliban group was by using 12, 13 year old kid to go and wear a jacket full of bomb and go to explode a school. This is how brutal it was. And that's it. So I'm open to any questions, any questions that you guys have, I'll love to answer. I know I haven't answered most of, you know, stuff about myself, but if you guys have any questions, I'll do that. Um, big difference. <laughs> I mean, uh, living in Pakistan was, um, I moved to the United States when I was uh, 15. And before that, we had to uh, escape this bad condition because of my father. He was really involved in politics. And before him was his father. So how the Pakistani government works is, uh, which I hate the most, if your father dies, the senior or the older son becomes the leader after him. So he's named after the father. So my father was named after my grandfather. When my grandfather died, my father took the power. And my father did a lot of good things. He wanted to make sure everyone goes to school. He wanted to make sure women and men have the same right in Pakistan, which he got a lot of encouragement from other people. So before coming to the United States, I lived in England. We had to escape this bad condition that was hap the conditions that were happening from 2004 to 2009. And then uh, I didn't like living in England, so I, I went back to Pakistan and then we came to the United States. Living in the United States is different because I don't have no family here. So it's like I miss my family. That's like the big difference that we have. And the only thing I can say is that I'm glad living here just because I can live in peace and I don't have to worry about getting shot, you know, like Malala did while going home from her school. So that's, that's the big difference that I can think about. And the other things are, you know, I still have 
amazing two friends, you know, that I hang out with, and they've been my friends from the last two years, so they're just amazing. So I have good friends here, good friends in Pakistan, and uh, all of my friends, you know, fulfill all the requirements, except the family. I don't have my family here, and I miss them the most, so that's the big difference. And the other thing is, living here is just, I'm glad to be here, just because I can live in peace. A lot of things, a lot of bad things I did <laughs> as a child. <laughs> Broken my cousin. Um, you know, like, like, I mean, silly things, silly things we did. Uh, we, we used to, um, this was another thing that became uh, banned in Pakistan after Taliban came into power. We used to play cricket all the time on the street, all our houses were pretty big, so within our house, with all the cousins, females and males, and we used to shout, we used to laugh, and that that thing just was pain in my house after Taliban came in, because we used to play cricket, and uh, playing cricket, you just have to be loud, you know, you have to yell at, you know, one another, and when my sister used to yell at me, my mother used to say, you cannot play cricket anymore. Because somebody might hear her, you know, her outside and might come in and kill her. So that's how life became under Taliban. It was just play. you cannot even laugh yeah. under Taliban when they were ruling uh, the state. So that, yeah. So we used to play cricket, football, um, ma many other things that we did. Many other things, yeah. Yes. What about your family to Fall River or to this general area? Uh, we went, uh, I mean, we came to the um, United States through JFK Airport, and we lived in Springfield for about six months. And uh, one of the friends that my father knows back in Pakistan, his best friends lives in Fall River. And he owns a lot of convenience stores. So when we lived in Springfield for six months, we had no clothing because we came out from, pa we ran out of Pakistan in the middle of the night. So we had no clothing. We had, uh, we had a lot of money that my father had because he he was pretty, you know, uh, rich in Pakistan. So we had money, but no clothing, no driving license, nothing. So when my father contacted his friend back in Pakistan, the friend told him that one of his best friends lives in the United States in Fall River, and uh, told him that he has a lot of convenience stores. So you should go and relocate from Springfield to. Uh, Fall River, so you might get a job, and that's the only reason we came to Fall River. And I love it because uh, <laughs> in Springfield we have we you we lived in a house. Here we live in an apartment with a lot of different people, with Portuguese, Spanish, and I love to you know live with all different kind of people. So in Springfield, I used to be lonely, you know, sitting in my room looking outside of the window. So that's why we came to Fall River. I never did. I never did. Um, yeah, I mean, I came when I was 15, and I al al always wanted to be a lawyer. But when I came to the United, yep, when I came to the United States and um, uh, coming to the United States, living with my uncle for about six months, he just ended up calling me engineer randomly, just because, <laughs> just because I blow up one of his TV. <laughs> Because I used to have those screwdrivers and all those equipments, and I used to open the wire plugs. So I used to do a lot of crazy things in his house. And he's like, he's like, one day you'll become an engineer. That's for sure. I did not know what kind of engineering, so I came to the, uh, I came and started attending BCC. I was civil, but uh, because of my two great friends. They took me from civil to mechanical because we all study together. We, we just have a great, you know, group here. So that's why I became, I switched to mechanical from civil. So yeah, hopefully, you know, I'll get my bachelor and then move on to master. They're moving on with me to master. <laughs> Mm 
Mm-hmm. Yes, we didn't live in the Swat Valley, but Taliban were ruling Swat Valley. That was like their main station. But uh, we lived in KPK. I lived in about one and a half hour from Swat Valley. So the KPK was, the whole state was affected, you know, by the Taliban rule. Because the Taliban not only invaded SWAT and start ruling SWAT, they also start, um, started to expand. And most people expand in the city of Akola Khatak, and that's the city where I used to go to school. And I used to see, and I used to like see bombs happening in my city next to my village, about 10 minutes away from, 10 minutes away from my village. So it affected SWAT very deeply and many Swatis were affected, but then as a whole, the whole state of KPK was affected because Taliban wanted to expand. And because of the expansion, people like my father said that this can't be, this is not happening. They start threatening my dad and they start started to threaten other people. And many people were killed. Many people were killed through suicide bombing. Many people were killed through gunmen. Many people were killed through all different, um, all different, you know, uh, ways. They, they, so they expanded in KPK. And after they found out that they have a pretty strong uh, su support in KPK and they have a pretty strong hold in KPK, they start going uh, internationally and nationally. So. Uh, to get the attention of the international media. So it was mostly KPK state, but Swat Valley was affected by them because they stationed in Swat Valley. And the Swat Valley was the cho chosen location. Is this, this is what I believe, Swat Valley was a chosen location just because how detached Swat was in the northern parts of Pakistan was from Pakistan and how undeveloped uh, these valleys were because they had their own lives. They had no TV in these valleys. They had, they, all they could have is a radio station. And to them, that was like the most advanced technology, a radio station, you know? So uh, that's why Taliban chose the uh, Valley of Swat because it was very illiterate, no education, no technology, and not a lot of, um, things that, they, that people have in Pakistan. This is why they end up choosing uh, the valley. This is what I believe. What is it like today? The situation in Pakistan is pretty good. Um, we don't see a lot of Talibans anymore. We don't see a lot of suicide bombing anymore uh, because of the military taking action in the uh, northern parts of Pakistan. I believe they should have took those actions back in 2002 and 3, so we would not have been going through this whole process, but they never did. So they are doing it now, and this is why Pakistan is pretty safe. Um, especially since 9-11, um, the work is Muslim or Islam, often been hated. Um, what do you think about that? Um, Yes. Um, the word uh, Islam means peace. Uh, to most of us, we wouldn't even know what Islam is because we have, you know, not read the religion Islam. And um, to them, and what's the, the difference between my Islam and their Islam is that they want to take all the laws from the book and interpret interpret these laws in a different way, in the way they believe in, and want to apply it to the people, and want the people to accept these laws. Like, one of the great quotes, I can quote the, um, the quote from the Holy Book, and it's saying that killing one human is killing the whole humanity. But they have changed the whole quote into killing one Muslim 
is killing all the Muslims. So they have changed the human wood into Muslim. And that makes me different than them. Because what they are doing is taking the laws that were made 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, and applying them in 2014, which we believe is not possible. It's like you can't do that. Back in the days, we had no education. We have been developing not even that long ago. This world is developing about, let's say, 150 years ago. We had no rights about 150 years ago that we have now. But the world that we are living in, like such as the Middle East and Pakistan and countries that, like Afghanistan are still, I believe, living in the Stone Age. The main reason behind this whole thing is education. So I believe if we have education, we would understand the word Islam and the religion Islam much better than what we are taught to be about the whole religion. So if we have education, take me as an example. When I was in Pakistan, I used to go to a holy school. And the priest used to tell me, this is the holy book. This is what God is telling you to do. This is this. This is that. I used to believe it. Believe it or not, I used to believe it. Because he's my teacher. He's my guru. And I used to uh, accept what he's telling me. But now that I know, now that I came to the United States, now that I'm older, I have more education, I have an understanding of what's right, what's wrong, I can, instead of listening to him, listening to some random guy without even knowing if he really understands the concept of Islam, I can go back to my holy book myself and read what Islam is telling me to do and what Islam wants me to do. The holy book of Islam, Quran, is all about life. If you all have chance, I would want you guys to read the first page of Quran. It talks about life. It talks about women's issues. It talks about men's issues. It talks about marriage issues. It talks about nature. It's not, it, it, see, what I believe it's not a holy book. I have read my holy book, and I believe it's a book of life. It gives me what I should do in my life in order to live nice and peacefully. But these people have interpreted those laws and those rules into something that it's just impossible in 2014. They believe that women cannot go to school. They believe that if women is, 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 is sick, she can't go to a doctor. So let's take this as an example. Let's say a woman is pregnant and she needs to deliver a baby. So she is going to seek someone in hospital, a female doctor. They said, oh, well, it's okay for you to see a female doctor, but you cannot see a male doctor. But the question comes in, how do you get female doctors? You can't get them from heaven. You have to send them to school so they can get an education and you know, get an understanding of how to be a doctor. So on one side, they are saying women can go to school. And then on the other side, they are saying women can go to a male doctor. So it's just this whole, I believe it's just this whole confusion they have. And they need to get it straight in their head <laughs> because it's, it just doesn't make sense to me. It, that doesn't make sense to me. You cannot go to, go to a female doctor. But at the same time, you can go to a female doctor if you have to. But how do we get female doctors? For them to go to school, right? But, yeah, that's, that's the whole thing. So I think if we have an understanding of, if we have education, if the people in Swat Valley had education, they would know what was right and what was wrong back then. But the only mistake they made back in 2005 was allowing Taliban to help them. And it wasn't really their fault because 2.5 people became homeless and they, they needed help. So I, I, I mean, I held the government to be responsible for all of what have happened. Uh, we can, I, I mean, I came with my family, my brother, I mean, my sister, me, and uh, my mother and my father. Uh, one of my sister was married, so she stayed in capital, 
and my brother, uh, he used to live in England, but now he recently moved back. Uh, the the question most people say is, why didn't your brother came in? You know, wasn't he, or your sister, wasn't they, weren't they like uh, being threatened by them? My family could have been threatened by them, but they never threatened my family. They wanted to kill the people who stood up against them. And my father stood up against him. And they knew if they were going to stop him from doing something, the only way they could stop him was either killing his kids or his wife or either him. So that's why my family had not really a lot of issues because most of the people in my family just stay quiet. They were like, okay, it's not our business. You guys do whatever you guys want and we will just live our life. And this is not how my father is. My father said, no, no, no. Like my my, he said my daughter cannot stay at home. She needs to go to school. And this is why we had to move and the whole family had to move. Not the extended family, but the family because we were the specific target. And um, speaking of that, he became special police officer uh, during 2004 to 2009 because the government of Pakistan and the government of KPK needed a lot of um, internal police that weren't police, um, that didn't look like police, but they were police uh, and they were doing the inside business. So, my, and my father was really involved. So if he saw any suspicious activity, he could, you know, call the CID or the Pakistani military and uh, inform them that this is what's happening. So he was a suspicious, you know, he was like a, uh, secret police and uh, one of his friends became police with him and when they came to target my dad one day his friends was was shot that was sitting next to him so he died so so they did came to my father never my father was never scared of them until one of his friends got shot next to him and this is when my father realized that you know what I have to move my family and I need to go because tomorrow they can come and just shoot me. So this was the time when they, my father realized that it's time for him to go and leave the country. <sighs> my advice is, I mean, I see a lot of people complaining on what they don't have. I don't have a fancy pencil. I don't have, it's like, it's like, stop it. Stop it. You know, we have people in African nations. We have a lot of people in Pakistan that sits on the floor and use wall instead of whiteboard, use rocks instead of chalks to get education. So be thankful for what you have. And first thing, respect your teachers. Because they are what they are, what makes you. So if you respect your teachers, if you give them respect, you will be respected in future by other people. So be thankful for what you have, and go for this. You know, uh, main goal of what you have. Go for it and do as much as you can. Because living in a country like United States is just a great thing that you can have in life. So life here is just amazing. Be thankful for what you have. This is the you know whole moral of the advice. So be thankful for what you have and be happy. Of course they out. did. I mean, um, I've been, if it wasn't because of Malala, we wouldn't see that change. If it wasn't because of my dad, we wouldn't see that change. And I hear a lot of um, stories, even in my village, uh, from small kids saying, 
I am Malala, I want to go to school. So it did have a lot of impact, even though some extremists, some militant groups, which we believe still exist in Pakistan, but they're really powerless. They can't do anything. They can't even move. They, they weren't happy of she coming into, of course, she coming into Birmingham, she getting the Nobel Prize. There was some negativity in Pakistan, but I'm just so happy that the uh, media in Pakistan supported Malala, and the, the majority of people supported Malala in Pakistan. So it did have a lot of impact, and uh, uh, if we see SWAT now, then um, six, seven years ago, it impacted SWAT, you know, um, mostly because we have technology coming in. We had media that went into northern part, one of the northern part of Pakistan, Bajawood Agency, when the military took over. And within the last 67 years of Pakistan history, not even a single media spokesperson went into that area. So we have media going in to make this whole piece of land part of Pakistan. So it did have a lot of impact. We used to call them the uh, no man's land, but now it's really a mainland because somebody went in and people are still, you know, people are living with the people who used to live there. So those people became part of Pakistan. We are building schools, we are building hospitals. So now it's really a part of Pakistan. I used to be scared of going to no man's land about six years ago, but now it's a part of Pakistan. It's a land of Pakistan, and if you want to go, you just say, oh, let's go to SWAT. But saying let's go to SWAT about five years ago was just scary. It was just saying, oh, let's go to the land of Taliban. So it's, it had a lot of impact. People like Malala, people like my father changed the Pakistani history. They, they became part of Pakistani history. And yeah, it did have a lot of impact. Yes. Uh, I can't visit Pakistan anymore just because um, I came to the United States and I took, uh, I have a refugee status, so I'm, I'm, I'm not allowed to go to Pakistan. So, thankfully, I can't go for the rest of my life. Uh, um, we talk to our family using, you know, either telephone or Skype, so we, we do talk a lot, uh, almost every day, so... They can visit me, yep, they can visit me. I told my grandmother to come and visit me, but she said, no, she's too old, so. I guess, I guess you know, we can get her come here, but she can come, but I can't go, so. I won't be able to go, I guess, for the rest of my life. Uh, yeah, but I still can't go. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm glad to live here, and I'm just so happy to, from, I'm just, thankful for my father to choose a country, you know, country like the United States, where I can live peacefully. So I'm just grateful to my God, to my father, to bring me to a country where I can just live with great people, you know, a lot of different diversity, you know, different people from different countries. So this is like a second Pakistan to me. This is a Pakistan to me, so yeah, this is like another home. See, the main reason behind this whole issue is education. And it's not only one issue. I take all these issues into this one big issue, and the solution is education. So if we don't have education, this won't happen anymore. And I, I do see the change. I, I believe Pakistan will change with time. It never did, but because of people like Malala, that had a lot of impact on the history of Pakistan, on the people of Pakistan, it will change, hopefully, with time, as time goes by, hopefully. That's it. Thank you. I want to thank Shabazz for taking the time out of his schedule to talk to us about um, Pakistan and his life and so I also want to thank you for coming today keep apprised we have some more one book events coming up down the pipeline and thank you for coming <laughs>